Hi, Dr. John here. I want to talk about this region here in the video today, the hypothalamic pituitary gland region. And this is where sensory central meets the master gland. Now I'm going to offer a mnemonic for the hypothalamic hormones and their modulating effects on the pituitary hormones. But before I do that, I'd like to do a brief review of hypothalamic pituitary endocrine axis feedback loops and receptor site interactions along this axis. Now I'm just going to refer to hypothalamic pituitary axis as HP from here on out. Recall that the hypothalamus is the bridge between two major systems, the nervous system and the endocrine system, and it receives a continuous barrage of sensory information from various sources, which it evaluates and integrates and determines whether the body is drifting away from homeostasis and if so will send hypothalamic hormones to the pituitary gland which in turn will send the appropriate pituitary hormones to target glands or target tissues which can then make physiologic responses and adjustments to reclaim homeostasis at least for the moment. It's a never-ending battle. So hypothalamic pituitary endocrine axis is what I just described. Let's take a look at the axis in a little more detail here. Notice that sometimes the HP axis is denoted by a specific endocrine gland. And there are four trophic hormones, which means four out of the six anterior pituitary hormones have specific endocrine glands that they seek out. Prolactin and growth hormone are more generalized in their effects. Now what exactly is an axis? An axis is a linear control structure consisting of a series of cells where each cell secretes one hormone to stimulate the subsequent cell. Now let's look at this animation here and notice that there is a looping back of the hormones from the thyroid gland and what we call this is a feedback loop. And most feedback loops in the axis are inhibitory and there are long loop reflexes and short loop reflexes. There's also, in addition to inhibitory, positive feedback loops. A couple examples. One is the uterine contractions that occur during labor. The contractions stimulate the hypothalamus to stimulate oxytocin release from the pituitary which incurs greater uterine contractions and there's a positive snowball or augmentation going on here until there's delivery. Similarly this oxytocin positive feedback occurs in the milk letdown reflex during breastfeeding. Now the hypothalamic pituitary axis we want to take a closer look at it on a cellular level. Now this is just a generic receptor here and this could be a cell along the HPA axis could be hypothalamus pituitary endocrine cell. Let's look at the interactions that occur at any given moment at this one receptor site. There could be synergism going on, a synergistic effect of several different chemicals, metabolites, hormones, and other molecules. There could be an antagonistic effects from molecules and there could also be permissive effects such as the thyroid hormone does this. And in addition to these effects there's also a pulsatile effect that some cells are sensitive to versus a continuous effect of chemicals. Um, and this is another th thing to consider in the equation. Now the hypothalamic pituitary axis is really more than a simple axis. Actually axis is an understatement or a misnomer. If you really look at all these loops here, the axis is more like an, a positively impulsed chain with augmentations and attenuations along its length. And I would c characterize it more looking like this. Now since a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, then I offer this. 
since the endocrine system and nervous system are literally linked at the hypothalamic pituitary region and it's the first link in the chain of events that occur along the axis I feel this is a plausible place to start in strengthening our knowledge base of the neuroendocrine system and in time of course we need to examine each link in more detail down the uh, axis but this is the mnemonic rationale so you might say okay I get it the neuroendocrine system is intricate but I know the pituitary hormones and most of the hypothalamic hormones or I only have a few holes in my knowledge of this area my rebuttal to this number one even simple concepts learned in lectures amazingly fade away after a few 24 hours at least they do with me and a lot of other people I'm sure rebuttal number two those few elusive hypothalamic pituitary effects that you claim to have trouble with may come back to haunt you when you take exams or in real clinical situations for example you may be in a standardized test situation efficiency exam situation a and p student or maybe you're on the wards and you're presented with a patient who obviously is got some kind of Cushing syndrome and uh, most people can see that who might be taking the exam or whatever so you got hypercortisolism and this patient claims to have no history of exogenous ingestion of glucocorticoids so now you're going to be doing a workup for primary versus secondary causes of her hypercortisolism which entails determining whether it's primary at the adrenal cortex secondary at the anterior pituitary gland or secondary at the hypothalamic level they also could have an ectopic tumor a perineoplastic syndrome so this gets complicated and it requires a comprehensive knowledge of the HP area in addition in the patient like this you're going to be presented with possibly a dexamethasone suppression test um, and uh, knowledge of interpretation of the results uh, understanding of the methodology and the rationale for the test entails understanding the HP area and this applies to other type of tests ruling out primary or secondary causes in endocrine uh, pathology you could be on a uh, test say the USMLE and be presented with a patient with hyperpigmentation of the gums and be asked to determine why uh, this patient has this clinical manifestation and uh, it's important for you to understand why primary has hyperpigmentation and ACTH levels that are high and why secondary doesn't comprehensive understanding of the HP area would allow this uh, clinical picture to make sense another example would be the neuroleptics and how they have effects on patients prolactin levels now the older neuroleptics are uh, much more likely to cause this problem and they're still used a lot they're cheaper and the newer ones have less of a side effect in this manner but you're going to be dealing with patients like this and you're certainly going to see test questions that entail understanding this mechanism of how dopamine is blocked by neuroleptics so the dopamine receptor is blocked which you essentially have here is a disinhibition of that receptor site giving rise to hyperprolactinemia and the side effects of of that such as galactorrhea, amenorrhea, decreased libido understanding why HP axis knowledge then there's the situations where you're going to have non secretory adenomas secretory adenomas the mass effect from these adenomas or from some other pathology hormonal excess if they're secretory and hypopituitarism then there's the whole pharmaceutical industry that is developing analogs of the HP hormones and um, there's that issue of growth hormone being used illegally and so 
these these chemicals that you're going to be looking at in the mnemonic are here to stay and going to be forever uh, in the clinical scenarios you're involved with. Now we're running out of time and so I'm going to say that uh, we're going to have to make a part two video to this. So my part two video will introduce the mnemonic and go through it stepwise and I sure hope that you all uh, tune in to the next video so that you can see what the mnemonic is and it takes about a minute to uh, formulate on a piece of paper and can be very useful in the, for the future retention of all this information. Take care. I hope to see you in the part two. Bye-bye.